Welcome to Followers Online. We're always glad that you choose to be a part of us. You know, if you've been a part of a church for a long time, you have likely heard some ridiculous arguments over the years. Christians have managed to make themselves look insane over arguing about what you can and can't do in church, what a church building has to look like, what you can spend money on, and how everybody should act. I think many of us have reached a point in our lives where we think Jesus would be tremendously disappointed in all of us who claim to be loving followers and act differently. So today we are going to head back into the book of James to talk about pure religion and how some folks seem to lose their way forgetting what it is that Jesus is calling us to be and to do. Rick says, the Apostle James talks a lot about the need to listen to God and each other and then to do what's right. Whether we obey will determine if we have a faith that's pure or pretend. So today we look at the need to heed. You know, we are a non-denominational church. We have no worldwide leader but Jesus and no headquarters but heaven. We have thrown off many of the church arguments that a lot of us grew up with over the years. And we take our stand very specifically on Jesus who holds the key to eternal life. That's our stand. You stood before creation Eternity in your hands And you spoke the earth into motion My soul
often have to renew our commitment to this over and over, but when we get to the place where we know that salvation isn't dependent on what I'm doing or what you're doing or what we're doing together, but on Jesus alone, we have made some big steps. we said last week, James is the book of practical Christianity, and it's filled with wonderful spiritual advice. 
Let's go back to the first chapter now to hear what the brother of Jesus has to say about how to behave and how to ensure that you are developing pure religion as opposed to the religion the world often teaches these days. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I hope my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead all the night has been won and I shall
So let's stop talking about the church and what denominations have gotten wrong and focus on you and me. When we open God's word, whether it's every day in your home or listening in your car or even once a week here at church, it is our opportunity to look at the mirror for ourselves. Far too often we accept what we see in the mirror as good enough. And that's not what Jesus calls us to. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, You are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. We come to a place of accepting that you can't clean up you enough to be acceptable in the eyes of God, and that's why we have Jesus. In terms of water, pure is better, is it not? Spiritually, it works the same way. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. Of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. My Savior, all the day long, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior, all the day long. Mercy, the 
his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Lord, today we come before you in a selfish state. Our focus is so often me-centered. We think mostly of how we'll survive this crazy world. We zero in on thinking about chores and responsibilities, what we'll eat, when we have to work, our relationships and our future. We think of food and fuel prices and we worry far too much about tomorrow. We confess we are not good about thinking of others, and we're often even less successful in reaching out to others to help them. Lord, make us more aware of those who don't have the benefits that we do. Help us first think of those people and then move to help them. We know that we can bless people in hunger, war, and disaster with money, but we know you've also put people around us in this city who are in need. Help us to open our eyes to see those we can help and make us your ambassadors here and around the world. Keep us from useless arguments and help your love radiate from within our church. Amen.
Jesus died my soul to save My lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all As we prepare our hearts for communion, let's briefly meditate on what the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-28. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. There are a few points that the Apostle Paul brings out in this passage. And the first point is that communion is a time of remembrance. We read that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So communion is a time for us to remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross. We remember his pierced body, his shed blood. Brothers and sisters, may we never lose sight of Christ's sacrifice for us. So communion is a time of remembrance. It is also a time of proclamation. Paul says in verse 26, For as often as you drink or you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim Christ's death to everybody. It's a proclamation of the gospel that Christ suffered, shed his blood, and died for the sins of the world. And I want you to notice that we proclaim his death until he comes. There's no expiry date for Holy Communion. And the last point Paul makes is that we are to examine ourselves while we take Holy Communion. So Communion is also a time of self-examination. Have we strayed away from the Lord? Do we have unconfessed sins? Do we have an unresolved conflicts with others? The whole purpose is to examine ourselves and that'll lead us to holiness. So communion is a time of remembrance, it's a time of proclamation, and it's a time of self-examination. Lord, we ask you to bless the communion emblems and all of those who gather around your table worldwide today. Amen.
Pure religion often starts with the recognition that we have much and others have little. God asks us to share. And I like this quote from Muhammad Ali, who said, service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. James offered a blessing today in our reading, and I want to leave you with it again. It goes back to the idea of looking in a mirror. He says, if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Wow, God will bless you for following his law. And James tells us that that law is about caring for others, controlling our tongues, and cleaning up our lives from filth and evil. And remember, religion might start with hearing the word of God, but far too often that's where it stops. My hope for each of you this week is that you look in that spiritual mirror and leave challenging yourself by saying, now what am I going to do with that? Now let's hear from Rick with his sermon called The Need to Heed. God bless you this week. Alexander the Great once went into a city and there was a poor man there that caught his eye and for reasons best known to Alexander himself. He gave this poor man entire city. It was a spontaneous gesture. Nobody quite understood exactly what was going on, but he gave an entire city to a man who had no station and no status. The poor man was astonished and said to Alexander, I can't accept this. I am not worthy. And Alexander said, let's be clear. This has nothing to do with your worthiness. This has to do with my generosity and my ability to give you this. And if you look at that story and you consider the fact that as verse 18 says in James 1, we out of all creation are the prized possession of God. Then we begin to see exactly how God looks at us in much the same way as Alexander looked at that man. The blessings we have have nothing to do with our worthiness. They have nothing to do with whether we deserve them or earn them, and that includes our salvation. The blessings we have from God are there because he loves us completely and passionately, and he wants us to have what is near and dear to his heart. And the problem with that, of course, is that there's so much in our lives that often gets in the way. And James is talking about some of that in the first chapter, in the passage that Carmen read so well for us today. There are things about you and there are things about me that impair God's ability to bless us in the way that he wants us to be blessed and then to pass those things on to other people. And there is one thing in particular that he starts with today that I think we can all relate to. My dear brothers and sisters, he says, be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to get angry because your anger your anger can never make things right in god's sight so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the message that god has planted in your hearts for it is strong enough to save your souls we could probably spend a whole month talking about that one small verse be quick to, slow to, and slow to. But what do we do? We are slow to listen, but we are quick to speak, and we are even faster when it comes to getting angry. And to illustrate that, I want to tell you about a novelist that many of you might know. His name is Sinclair Lewis. When he was extremely popular, he was on a cruise ship one day, and he was kind of tickled to see, as he looked out on the people on the deck, that there was a woman reading his latest novel. And he could tell just from where she was in the scheme of things in that book, that she was about to hit a pivotal moment in this story, one that he had crafted over many, many days. And he was really anxious to see how she was gonna to react to this. And so the woman is reading and he's watching and the woman is reading and he's watching and she gets to that denouement, that part where everything becomes so crucial. And she walks over to the deck and she 
flings the book into the sea. She is so disgusted. Lewis thought to himself, that's not exactly what I had in mind. And she hasn't even heard the end of the story. And I would submit to you that one of the reasons why we get so angry so often is because we never get to the end of the story. When you listen to the people in your lives and you find yourself getting angry, why does that happen? Why do we get angry? Yeah, things are not going the way we want. And the truth of the matter is that oftentimes it's because they see things in a way that we do not. They have preferences. They have perceptions. They have ways of seeing things that do not dovetail with what we're thinking ourselves. And so often, often, we don't even hear the end of the story because we're not really listening to them anyway. We're too busy trying to figure out what we're going to say next. Have you had those conversations? where it's just clear that whoever you're talking to is not really listening to what you're saying. They're just rehearsing what comes next as they make their points. And sometimes we're more interested in winning arguments than we are being rational or being considerate or being loving. Sometimes we don't hear the story because we have these preconceived ideas about what people think. We cut them off. We don't even hear the end of the story because we assume that we know what they think and what they're going to say. Or we assume that they're just wrong to begin with and that we've got things figured out. And I think the truth of the matter is that we are sort of hardwired to be self-centered. And so when Jesus comes along, and this is reinforced by James, and he says, you need to put others first. That's counterintuitive. It's not something that comes easily or quickly for us. We struggle with that because, yes, we do tend to think that perhaps we've got it right and lots of other people have got it wrong. And so we have wrong assumptions. We have impatience to deal with. And we have this pride that surfaces often and makes us think that we know better. And whenever all of those things start to surface in our conversations, in our relationships, we know that things are not going the way they're supposed to. And when that happens, then the anger begins to surface. And sometimes it's just a flashpoint. Sometimes it just comes out of nowhere. Sometimes it's been simmering for some time. Regardless, we know that anger is very, very destructive. There's a reason the word anger is in the word danger. There is all kinds of peril when we allow the, the will and the love of God to be impaired by temper. And yet we often do. Do you remember that story about Sinbad the sailor and when he's on the island and, and there are coconuts up in the trees, but the men can't reach them. They're just too high. And the apes are up in the trees. And so what the men do is they start to take rocks and they throw them at the apes in the trees. And the apes become so incensed that they take the coconuts and they throw them down at the men. Mission accomplished. Sometimes that's the way anger works in our lives too. We take the bait and we end up losing our temper and then giving in to what our foes want in the first place. And if we're not careful, we will lose sight of the fact that anger can never accomplish the righteousness of God. That's what he says here. Anger is entirely destructive. It's a fiery flame that consumes everything in its path. And yes, it's normally because of pride, because we elevate ourselves and we lose sight of the humility that we need to have. And that's why we often play right into the hands of those who would oppose us. James says we need to be quick to listen. Let's really hear people out. We need to slow that impulse to always have something to say. And if there's anything I've learned in the last several years, it is that we don't always have to share our opinion. Look, if you want my opinion, I've got one on just about everything. But it doesn't mean that we always have to let people know what we think and what we think is wrong with their opinion. I'm really struggling with this even now, but I'm really working at trying to keep my big mouth shut because I don't always need to be right. I don't always need to be heard. Now look, if there is something at stake where we really need to speak up for truth or for justice or for love, then we need to have the courage and the grit to do that. But if it's really just venting your spleen or having your say, let's do us all a favor and just shut up. 
because it's not necessary. And I think we often lose sight of what our real priority is if we're just so intent on getting our opinions out there because we think it's so important for other people to hear them. He says, your anger can never accomplish the things of God. You can never get righteousness out of anger. And that's because anger impairs relationships. It destroys our ability to love other people and it blinds us to the goodness that we see in others. So let's be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get anger because that's the way God would have us be. And that, by the way, is part and parcel of what he's talking about in this entire section. He says, get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the message that God has planted in your hearts because it's strong enough to save you. Do you see what he's saying there? The key to not getting angry, the key to not losing sight of what's important to God is to make sure that we can humbly accept the message that God has placed within us. Humility is the key point. Because when we elevate ourselves, we take God off the throne. And we rise ourselves up over those who are around us. And let me tell you this, if you're intent on calling the shots in your own life, chances are very good that you're prone to want to call the shots in everybody else's life too. And so with humility, we learn to kind of keep ourselves in the proper perspective. We keep God on the throne. We make sure that we serve people around us because we don't have the sense that they don't deserve it. We need to be people of life and love and laughter who reach out to people who are different from us, who see things differently, who want different things without trying to cram them into the mold of our own preconceived ideas. It's just not ever going to work. Get rid of the filth and the evil in your lives, James says. I want you to imagine for just one minute that you've got two bags of garbage, and they're heavy, and they stink to high heaven, and they're not pleasant in any way. But you're going to take those with you everywhere you go this week, whether you're going to your family, whether you're going to work, whether you're going to church, I want you to assume that you're gonna take these two big, heavy, stinky bags of garbage and they're gonna go with you everywhere this week. What would your life be like? You'd feel the weight, you'd smell the smells. It would be terribly inconvenient and that's just putting it mildly. And yet I would submit to you that there are lots of us that carry two sacks of garbage through life all the time. What is it that you're carrying? What is it that you have refused to release? It might be a sin, but it could also be things like hurt and pain and anger and the things that are not ever going to accomplish the righteousness of God. I'm fond of saying that if the first followers of Jesus who were fishermen had been called and they had followed Jesus, but they had insisted on taking their nets with them, just imagine what their lives would have been like carrying the fishing nets everywhere. They would get snagged. They'd get caught up on everything. You couldn't live your life the way you were supposed to. We're either going to leave the past behind and we're going to leave our sin where it needs to be placed at the foot of the cross. Or we're going to carry those things forward with us and they are going to cause us no end of grief in our lives because we're never intended to carry those things. The truth of the matter is that God can never place a blessing in your hand if it's already a case where you're preoccupied with the things you refused to release and let go. God wants to bless us. God yearns for us to have the things that he knows will make us happy and fulfilled and significant in our lives. But he will never force you to surrender the things that you refuse to give up. But he can't put those blessings in your hands if that's where you find yourself. But if we humbly accept the word and the will of God, that's going to change everything. And by the way, if you read that passage where it says we need to look intently into the perfect law and we need to accept the word that is planted in our hearts by God. And you thought about the Bible? Probably not. At the time that James is written, it's most likely that of the 27 books of the New Testament, 
there are three in existence. It's widely held that Mark was the first gospel, followed soon after by Matthew. So Mark is probably existent at this point. And then you have Matthew, then you have James, and maybe Galatians. That's it. There is no New Testament, and there won't be a complete New Testament for a long time to come. So when James is saying you need to have that perfect law, you need to have that, that message that God places in your heart, he's not just talking about Scripture. Now, obviously, we have the ability to read the whole collection. We're blessed by this very important gathering of Scripture. But I think he's also talking about God's ability through the Holy Spirit to plant within us an understanding of what he wants from us. We have scriptural principles. We have the Old Testament to guide us as they did in the first century, but canon was not complete. God doesn't have to just rely on scripture to show us the way. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. So God informs our ability to read scripture and to understand what it means for our lives. And regardless of how we look at this, we need to make sure that we can humbly accept the word and the will of God. Because if we don't, the only alternative is for us to go on our own and to place more stock in what we think and on what we want and on what we do. And none of that is going to end well. We need to make sure that we can practice humility in our lives. And I love the story of the college president. He's just a, just a college president of a small Christian school. And one day he's out painting the walls of one of the buildings. Now, this was something that he did on a regular basis. If there was a job to do, he didn't see himself as the president of the college. He was out there doing what needed to be done one day. A very rich and powerful donor comes to the school and he's toying with the idea of making a donation. So he shows up at a building where there are workers and he says that he would like to see the college president. A worker stops him and says, well, if you come back at one o'clock, he'll be in that building right over there across the green at one o'clock. So the man went back at one o'clock. And he was introduced to the college president, who, of course, was the man that he had spoken to, the man who was in overalls and covered with paint. The donation happened like that because the man said to himself that this man feels strongly about this school to that degree where he's willing to do anything and everything. And I want to be a part of that. And people will notice that in our lives, too. If we truly are humble enough so that there is no job that is beneath us, if there is nobody that is not good enough for us, if we are truly humble in the way that we see ourselves and the world around us and our ability to negotiate that, that will make all the difference in the lives of other people and how they see us. I love what F. B. Myers said. He said, you know, when I was a young man, I used to think that, that God's blessings were on shelves, one above the other, and that the taller I stood and the more I reached, the happier I would become. And he said, I've come to understand that God's blessings are on shelves, one below the other. And the lower I stoop, the happier I become. He had learned the secret of humility and how that informs not only who we are, but how we live and what we do, even what we think. And it's so important that we have that because if we're not so careful, we end up doing something that James says a lot about, and that is we delude ourselves. Maybe you saw this as Carmen was reading it through the first time. After he says, you have to get rid of all that filth and evil in your life and humbly accept the message and the word of God, he says, remember. Remember, it is a message to obey, not just to listen to. And if you don't obey, you're only fooling yourself. For if you just listen and you don't obey, it's like looking at your face in a mirror, then walking away and forgetting what you look like. You see yourself, you walk away, you forget. But if you keep looking intently into God's perfect law, 
the law that sets you free. And if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing that. Has it occurred to you that so many people these days are on the extreme when it comes to looking in the mirror? We've got some people who will never spend any time in front of that image because they know what they're going to see. And if you never look in the mirror, you never see the flaws that are part of who you are, the things that mar what God is trying to accomplish in your life. And there are some people who think that there are no flaws to find, and so they never look. And there are other people who are so concerned because they know the flaws are there to such a degree, they can't bring themselves to look at that. And that has terrible consequences for us when we're just paralyzed by fear or by oblivion, and we don't do what we know we need to do. And on the other extreme, you've got people who do nothing but spend time looking in the mirror, but they're looking at the wrong things. We are in the selfie generation, and if you think that's just young people, you need to give your head a shake. We are obsessed with ourselves to a great degree in this culture, and it shows through in so much of what we do and how we treat each other. Instead, we need to understand that the way we really have a true understanding of ourselves is to be able to look intently into the Word of God and to listen to the people of God who will tell us the truth and speak with love and rely on the Holy Spirit to give us objectivity, candor, and honesty. Only then can we really look in the mirror and see what's there, the good, the bad, and the ugly. God gives us the ability to see ourselves with truth and with understanding and discernment. But none of that is going to matter if we don't take the time to act on what we actually see when we are peering into that mirror and seeing ourselves. If all you see is the bad, that's not healthy and that's not good. And that doesn't accomplish the righteousness of God either. Because you are his prized possession. Yes, you have your stuff. And we all have our flaws and our foibles and our failures. But God looks at us and he says, you are important. There are those words from the help. You is good. You is important. If you've never seen that movie, check it out. You are good. And you are important to God. Not because of you, but because of what he's able to accomplish in and with and through you. And we need to be able to see our goodness because if we're convinced that there's nothing good about us, then that will play out in the way that we treat other people. Because after all, we tend to love others as we love ourselves. If you don't love you, you're just going to cause lots of problems for a lot of other people. And at the same time, if you're enamored with yourself, if you're preoccupied with you, you cannot live out the purpose and the plan that God has for you. Because I hate to break it to you, but it's not all about you. It's not all about you. And you know what I really find interesting is, in this passage, James twice says, look, if you do this, you're only fooling yourself. If you don't pay attention to what God is saying, you're only fooling yourself. You may think you're righteous. And look, there are lots of people, lots of people who think that they are righteous because they're hanging out with the right crowd. They're with the Christians. They're reading their Bibles. They're praying. And James says that is not the test. The test is to what degree are you doing what you're hearing when you're going through your life? What's your obedience like? How deep and how strong is your response to God? Because really, that's what's going to make the difference here. Otherwise, he says, you're fooling yourself. You walk away, you forget, you go back to the way you were doing things before. And he says, that has everything to do with how people will see you, how God will see you, and frankly, even how we see ourselves. He says, if you claim to be religious, but you don't control your tongue, and you're just fooling yourself. There's the second reference to self-delusion. And your religion, get this, hear this, your religion is worthless. Other translations say it's useless. Your 
words can undermine everything you're trying to do in your life that's good and whole and holy. Gossip, lies, slander, boasting, anger, it just goes on and on and on. And James will tell us that the tongue is so small, but it is so mighty. And he's going to come back to that later. But we all know the damage our big mouths can do. Some of us more than others. He says, you've got to control that or your whole religion is worthless. Because people will be so busy looking at what you're saying that they're not going to look at how you live. And not only that, but if you're angry all the time or you're boastful or you're prideful or all the rest of that, chances are that your life isn't going to look any better than your words convey anyway. He says, pure and lasting religion in the sight of God means that we must care for orphans and widows and their troubles and refuse to let the world corrupt us. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's the test of your faith this week. Are we looking after the vulnerable? Are we refusing to let the world corrupt us? Or are we just playing into what the world wants? You know, Romans 12 says, we must not become con conformed to the ideas and the values of this world. Instead, we need to be transformed by God so that he can show us how good and perfect his will really is. And once we know that, and once we embrace that, and once we live that, then God can place those blessings in our hands. We need to be very careful that we have our words and our attitudes, our words and our behavior completely in sync founded on the principles that God blesses us with so that we can be happy and fulfilled ourselves. And so in turn, we can bless those and serve those around us. Because that's really the only way we're going to hear the end of God's story. And sometimes we're just like that woman on the boat. We get to the point in our lives where God tells us some things about ourselves or about life that we don't want to hear. And without doing so literally, we often just kind of abandon the story. We start living it because we don't like what we're saying. And when we're tempted to do that, it simply means that our pride has gotten the best of us. So in your words, in your temper, and in your behavior this week. Follow the story to the end, and God will bless you for it. That's his promise.